Willie D Live. It's Willie D, y'all. Back with another episode of information and instructions to help you navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world. In the studio, P. Frank Williams. I'm in the house. Hey. Man, I, I thought about changing my name and going with an initial first. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. Like, I think that's kind of cool when people do it. It adds a little mystery. Okay. Everybody want to know what the P stands exactly, for. What the P true. stand for. Yeah. All that type of stuff. I ain't going to even ask you because that's why you put a P instead of putting your name. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so but I will tell you, though, people don't know. They usually be like, is it Percy? Is it Pimpin'? Is it Blair? Is it, you know, <laughs> Purnell? Yeah. But uh, P. Frank actually stands for Positive Frank. Yeah. Yeah. In real life. In real life, it, do you mean that's your name for? Well, is I got your that real nickname, name. Well, okay, my government right. name. But in terms of somebody as a uh, growing up in Oakland, I was a junior high backstory. There was a girl who used to be complaining, just you know, kind of like kind of a Willie D story. She'd be complaining every day, Asian girl. Oh my God, and whatever. And I was like, No, it's gonna be all good. Yes, don't worry. It's class, whatever. And then she's like, Oh, you're always so positive, Mister Positive, whatever. And so every day, so there's Positive Frank, and then people are like, Oh, Positive Frank, what up? And then it. You know, I can't be in the entertainment industry saying positive Frank, and it was already positive K, yeah. so I shortened it to <laughs> That's P Frank. Dope. That's yeah, but dope. it is it is come from positive Frank, yes. That's dope. Yes, yes, yes. Man, yes. you got a dope story, man. Like your life is really interesting. A lot of people who we talk about on a daily basis, their careers have been touched by you in some way. Mm -hmm. Like you are that dude. <laughs> like, so, and, and this all started with I heard a love letter. You used to write love letters for the homies in the hood. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so, yeah, growing up in Oakland, I grew up in an area called Funk Town. Um, and I grew up in the shadow of the Black Panther Party in real life. I saw Bobby and Huey and, you know, and the Hells Angels. And then I was seeing Felix Mitchell. And, and, you know, I grew up in a weird place where very conscious, but very street and very dangerous. You know, you're from Fifth Ward. And so as a kid, I was in the hood. I was like the gangster's little brother. You know, I was like the kid, like, the you know, in the hood, yeah. the people shooting and beating up. They're like the little kid with the glasses and the books. So a lot of my homies, you know. They were street affiliated or whatever, and they're dealing drugs. And, you know, they like Lakeisha or Boom Keisha or whoever or mm -hmm. Tasha. But they don't really know how to, you know, write her a letter. Like, hey, man, that's a little, the kid, the one that'll be writing it with a little notebook all the time and writing little poems and stuff. Um, and I was like, yo, man, I could write a letter for you. 20 bucks, 15 bucks. Tell me what she looked like. You know what I mean? I, was, I guess I was being a reporter at the time. I didn't know it. But, yes, in the early 80s, I got my start, I guess, as a journalist. I didn't know it. By writing love letters for my homies. And I would charge them, though. I wasn't yeah. doing it for free. So uh, you, you give me a little description of what she looked like, her body, how you feel about her. I'd write up, you know, oh, girl, Tasha, you know, my name's Willie, and I was thinking about you in eighth grade class, and then, you know, you walk with the yellow dress on, and the way you <laughs> smell was amazing. And then the brother's like, yeah, make, write some more of that shit, write some more of that shit. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, what you charging? <laughs> I started 10 at first. Ten dollars. Yes, this is in the eighties. I was making bread. Let me tell you. Were you, in, were you at? Is, is this at Roosevelt Middle School? Yes. Yep. And, and ten bucks. You getting ten dollars? And in sometimes middle school I, uh, for no, but I'll be doing like five or six letters a week. What? So I was making money. I was a hustler. I me, mean, I was like, I had no money, so I'm like, I gotta find a way to make some bread, just like you. So yes. And then I started to write in twenty. By the time the crack situation, because they had, I'm watching them bigger wad of money. I'm like, you can give me that yeah. twenty. So yes, that's how I started in the game. Man, yeah. uh, now are you still a writer? Do you write poetry to your woman? Um, I did recently. I do write sometimes, but I, you know, I obviously we know each other because of me being a writer at the Source and LA Times. But um, I write the shows that you see. So if you watch American Gangster or Unsung, I've taken my writing that you would see in a magazine or a newspaper, and I write the show. The, from the, you know, Houston's most infamous neighborhood, it's the Ghetto Boys. Right. Well, you know, so I do that, but not in the same way I used to. And by the way, man, salute, salute, salute on what you did for us on Unsung. Okay. That was Thank an you. amazing episode. I've seen a lot of people try to chronicle Ghetto Boy's story, but you did it in a way that is capsulated in history. Right. Like, that was dope. Thank you. it started out. Yeah. I like the way you threw that little bell in there from when I used to box. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. You know, yeah. That was dope. And you guys are obviously one of my favorite uh, things that I've ever been involved with, just story-wise. And, you know, we know each other from all the way in the 90s. You know, that's people don't realize that, you know, when you guys were going through back and forth, I would chronicle that, and when you got back together, and then it made sense because we already had a history to do, you know, almost 15 years later to do the unsung. And so it's good to see you guys. And, you know, I think, like I tell Bone Thugs or people I've known for years, 
just to see you guys healthy and alive, obviously Bill died, is a victory, you know, because of where we've come from, the cancer, the drugs. Think about all the people that started when we started in the late 80s, early 90s that aren't here, yeah. whether it be health or an unfortunate situation, death, murder. So it's good. You're healthy. My girl's like, damn, Willie look good. I'm like, yeah, he ain't yeah. bloated. He ain't lost all his teeth. He don't look good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Think about how people are our age or, you know, looking yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is a blessing, man. And it's, you know, it's, when I think about it, it it's kind of scary when I think about it. You know, it kind of mm-hmm. spooked me a little because I'm so much more appreciative of people like you mm-hmm. when I look at you. Because mm-hmm. I know I can't take it for granted that you'll be here tomorrow. Correct. You know, hopefully you live to be as long as you want to live. Mm-hmm. But it when I see the people that put the work in, especially, and uh, but even, even just loved ones, you know, like mm-hmm. some of my... Uh, good family members, like really close family members, are in the twilight of their life, mm-hmm. and you know, every moment you look at them, like even, you try not to be cynical, right? Right. But it's hard to not n- know that the end is coming. Well, I mean, we are. You know, in, 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 I think in a, of that. We're in know? the third act of our life, by the way. If you look at your yeah. life in quarters, I guess you know, or even. 25, 25, if you get to 75 or 30, 30, 30, more of your life is behind you than it is in front of you. So right. I'm always really worried about what am I going to do with the time left. Even with the jobs that I take or things that I do or situations or whatever, I'm really cautious, especially because there's been so much, you know, on Pac and Big and Guru and different people that I've known and, you know, Easy e or even my boy Slim 400 who just got murdered in uh, Inglewood like a couple years ago. I think about the moments that I have with it, and I'm like, I, I, I want to cherish them. So I'm like, let me create more moments um, in the culture and just, you know, it's important to do that and be thoughtful and thankful. Yeah, and so you produced Hip Hop Homicides, uh-huh. right? Was it Homicides? Yeah, Hip Hop yeah. Homicides, you did um, Who Shot Pac and Biggie and, mm-hmm. and a number of other stories along those lines, like crime type st- theme mm-hmm. stories. <laughs> Why do you produce those type of uh, those type of stories, and why why are you so passionate about bringing those type of stories to life? Well, you know, I always thought um, when I was starting out in hip hop, uh, I remember a lot of them didn't take us very seriously, right? And so I would read Rolling Stone, I started reading the Source or whatever, and I was like, oh, the Source, they're actually talking about these are people who are going from inside the culture to outside. I'm not an outsider of it because I come from it, and they know how to tell our story. So even as a kid in high school, we needed people of color to tell our stories. It's not fair. I remember when I was working on um, uh, Who Killed Tupac on A&E with Ben Crump. There's a six-part series that I did with Ben Crump that I produced and I also was in. There was a white guy who um, we were doing like the little fact sheet about Tupac. And so... He uh, told him, well, you know, when Tupac was a kid, Afeni made him read the Wall Street Journal back and forth in the New York Times and explain different stories to her and whatever. And then the guy said, that could never have happened. Tupac would have never have read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And I was like, oh, that's what you think. And you're in control of the media. And so without me being there, it's important. So for me, it's important that people like me tell our stories. You know, as working as a reporter at the LA Times, I can't tell you how many stereotypical headlines or things that they were going to do or say. You know, when Tupac died, I remember there was a reporter that I was friends with, and he was like, that's good. That motherfucker, he deserved to die. Criminal and gangster. Yeah, he, he just... He thinks that way about all black men. He, he wanted to say that anyway, you know. So right, every so every chance he gets, correct. You right. know, I'm sure he said the same thing about Michael Brown and right. Tavon, uh, yeah. Trayvon Martin. And, but I, but I'm saying to your to your question, to me, right? I have to tell these stories, and it needs people like me to tell those stories. You know, when I was at the Grammys, this was whatever, maybe like a year or two before Meth and um, Mary won for all. It's going to be like '93, right after Will Smith. So I'm around there. And I was in the, in the, so in the Grammy room backstage, which, you know, there's like a press area. And so they never didn't want to have hip hop on TV. People don't remember. There was a time when they wouldn't let hip hop artists. Right. You know, it's not that long ago. And uh, I remember being in the room and they wouldn't even let black reporters or black journalists in the place. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking how far we've come now that hip hop is the most dominant thing in the world. So I'm saying it's important that people like me tell stories about people like us yeah. because they get it, you know, totally different. Some of us are 
in a position now where we are the gatekeepers. We were on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. And some of us have elevated to ownership and upper management, so mm -hmm. to speak. And I've noticed that some of us have gotten in those positions and, and instead of continuing to fight for the culture and fighting to try to lift everybody up and bring everybody up with them, they decided, you know what, I'm going to be a gatekeeper and I'm going to make sure that only me and my buddy is cool. Right. I've seen that happen, mm -hmm. uh, especially in hip hop. How often have you seen something like that happen in film and television? All the time. I mean, I think um, I have a friend and I always tease him um, because we go out, we meet people. And he doesn't really want to give me access to his white people. He keeps his certain white people to himself so he can be the mm -hmm. black guy for that white people. Right. And me, I'm like, I want to get everybody an opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm from the Black Panther thing. I'm opening up the back window in the bathroom so you can sneak in and let's all get in and get a check. You know, I have a new company for the culture, by the culture. And the point of that is that the culture makes things about the culture so mm -hmm. that people of color have a chance to tell their own stories. And so even though I'm in these rooms and a lot of times... I do these shows and I'm the black person with an all white crew. And so now I want to make sure that people of color get opportunities behind and in front of the camera because a lot of times, you know, I'm doing something now and I was on the phone with the people and I won't say the network, but there's not one person of color tell me they were doing a show. It's about hip hop and crime. But the, the questions that they had were just, well, why did these rappers kill each other? They are making a lot of money now. Shouldn't they stop doing that? Like, the, this is what they are saying, and they're about to produce a whole thing about us. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's important that I dare and say something and try to weave that story? It's always good to have some of us in the room. But when you start to sell out, you know, as you you know, you know, guys always talk about selling out, I don't do that. You know, I keep the message thorough from the culture. And I think, um, I got to say, a lot of white mainstream people respect that because I speak their language and I have all the degrees and the paperwork, but then I'm telling you, you know, that ain't cool. So you got to have a few of us in the room, you know, because there's a bunch of Negroes up in there. They're doing a little shuffle real quick to get that check. And that's the sad part about it is that they care more about being accepted than respected. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that these coconuts out here, these black coconuts, the White folks and nobody else like them. They don't. They don't respect them. They might like being around them because they know that they can use them and and you know tell their nigger jokes and stuff like that in front of them and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But they don't respect them. Right. And it's like they know that they don't respect them, but it's like they don't even care because they care more right. about acceptance. Right. Or just being in the room. A lot of us. You know, integration, I think, was one of the worst things that happened to us. I believe that because I, I came from a very black city. Yeah. And, you know, when we were together, we had our own neighborhood stores. We did stuff. And now we're chasing, you know, um, and we could, got, you know, you and I could talk for hours about how we're chasing white materialistic ideas. Let me get Louis Vuitton. Let me get whatever Gucci as soon as I get a thing or whatever. You know what I mean? And so um, our unity is more important to me than selling out or doing whatever. Yeah. You know, because and again, you know, I try to operate with integrity, which is more important to me than anything else. Because, you know, as Cube say, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, if I sell out for this moment when I'm going or people coming, you know, people always say, man, you always keep it real. You're thorough. I'm like, I came from the day when you had to be thorough, you know, because I know you're a boxer. You know, you put two people in the ring and that's how you solve it. You don't. Hey, well, fuck it. Let me just go shoot Willie real quick because I don't really want to fight him. And so yeah. I come from the place where you got to try to fight for yours. Yeah. Oak Town, baby. Oak Town. You got an interesting story about Too Short also. <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> Tell me about that story about you and Too Short on the bus. Oh, what do you mean? You were, you, you told a story once that about Too Short being on the bus. Oh, yes, yes, Selling yes. his... Uh, yeah, and so when I was a kid um, in Oakland, and this was like the early, no, maybe like the late 70s, early. That's like 82, 83. And this is before hip hop was anywhere. And so um, there was like a main bus, I'm sure, in everybody's city. East 14th is like our main thorough. And so I was in the maybe seventh, or eighth, eighth grade, maybe. And uh, I saw Todd. He was just starting to bubble. There's a thing called mixtapes back in the day. He used to do two for five. You could mm -hmm. buy two tapes for $5. And so if you wanted more, then he would give you a shout out on your tape, but you had to pay him like 20, 30 bucks. So I was a, like a kid and I got on the bus and Todd was on the bus with a boombox rapping. 
and basically just rapping a little beats and talking to people. People get on the bus, he'd perform and do whatever. And so he, before he became Too Short, Too Short used to be on the tape on the bus rapping. And I saw him as a kid. Was he rapping them nasty tales? Yes. But no, he was like, I'm too short. It was more like, I'm too short from Oakland. You know, that kind of like basic shit. Right. And I don't think he would, you know, do that on a bus because he'd probably get kicked off. But he was, people beating on the thing, doing whatever. And then the ironic thing, which is God is good, um, many years later, I did his unsung and I went back on the bus with him and had him right ride on the bus so oh, me and him yeah. rode on the bus Dope. and uh we've happened to got lucky because we found an empty bus and the bus whatever was because i'm sure legally he wasn't supposed to let me in too short on the bus but right. you know todd got on the bus and uh, signed the autograph for him but yes as a kid i saw too short he wasn't he he, he, he don't stop rapping so he obviously you know, took that to heart <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah uh <laughs> short is like Short is a beast, and his work ethic, man, is unmatched. Yes. The dude got, like, 20-some uh, studio albums yes. out. Like, it's, it's and he, he proceeds with a real—I um, was just telling you know, in our, our, we did a lecture yesterday over at uh, NRG Center, and one of the things I said is about how, with, with Short, he told this to me one time, and I don't agree with him, but this is his philosophy. Sometimes he'll have security, but I see him all the time, like, sometimes in the airport by himself. And I was like, are you out of your mind? Like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? We don't, it's in today's world. He's like, I don't put aggressive energy out so people don't come at me that way. So he, of course, is afraid every now and something might happen, but he's not wearing humongous chains, but yeah, he has that energy that nobody's want to do that to him. It's more love. You understand what I'm saying? Where a lot of these young people want to rob you and beat you. It never happened to him ever. Yeah. I, I was surprised. I went to... Santa Monica to meet Mike Judge. Mm -hmm. You from you know you might you know he's Mike a Judge writer. Mike Judge, creator of creator of Beavis and Butthead. Yes, he's a writer. Idiosyncrasy, yes. all yes. that type of stuff, and director. Mm -hmm. um, so I go out there to meet Mike, and we get ready to leave the bar, and he grabs a bicycle. I said, "Man, you 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 riding a bicycle?" Yeah, man, I, I, I ride it all the time. I say, man, you might judge, man. You ain't afraid of nobody. You know, you're not worried that somebody going to try to run up on you or something. No, man, no, you know. And it is. It's, it's the energy. It's yeah. the kind of energy that you mm -hmm. put out there. Like, you know, most of the times I move around, I don't have a bodyguard, but I'm not worried. I, you know, I'm really not too much worried about that type of thing anyway because I trust myself more than I trust any other man anyway. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's another man can guard my body better than me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Too Short, I mean, uh, 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 Tupac had bodyguards the night he was murdered. Biggie had bodyguards Correct. the night he was murdered. Correct. You know, so uh, one of the most difficult things in life to to stop is a determined mind. Mm. And that's whether they're doing something negative or positive. Right. You know, somebody who's just determined to do something, mm. it's very difficult to stop them from doing that. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just practice good energy. And, you know, I know certain kind of people that just got bad energy, bad luck, always mm -hmm. into something sneaky and slick. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a buddy come over to the studio once. His friends... Um, a, a buddy of mine's younger brother came over to the studio looking for work. And I said, no, I can't hire you, man, because I'd have to hurt you. I mean, your brother going to fall out because you steal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> like, you steal. Right, okay. And me and your brother going to fall out. So I was like, nah, can't do that. Right. But, you know, I was thinking about uh, uh, your, your movement because you are a movement. Like, your thing is that you're a storyteller at at heart, the core of who you are. You, you're a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you tell these stories, like how difficult it is, is it to bring these stories to life oftentimes when you're telling our story mm -hmm. and trying to get people who are the gatekeepers to disseminating those stories. Correct. How, hmm. how how difficult is well, that? Well, it, it's obviously tricky. You know, when uh, when I covered black culture sort of in music and pop culture at the L.A. Times in the 90s, that was when the time the, co the culture wasn't as popular, but it once Pac and Big and, and uh, Death Row and Bad Boy and all of that started really blowing, 
then it became easier. Excuse me. But for instance, I just directed this project. It's called about Freaknik. I mean, everybody was talking about it on the internet. And so it's called Freaknik, The Wildest Party Never Told. It's airing on Hulu. In so it's actually going to come out? Yes, I, I'm done. I literally I picture locked it, meaning I locked the picture. It's being submitted to festivals and all of that now. But it was interesting because you would think Hulu, which is obvious you could imagine the racial background and the people that I'm talking to and charge they aren't don't look like us. But I think that they understood the cultural significance of Freaknik. So when we're out, when y'all try to pitch something, so for instance, in television film, you get the deck, you get a sizzle, you go to BET, you go to VH1, you go to whoever, say, hey, well, you want to buy this project and give us some money to produce it? It will own your thing. They're like, yeah, here's some money. Go do it, produce it. Or no, we don't like it. Within almost the first few days, Hulu bought the Freaknik thing. There's other people interested because they understood the cultural significance of it. Uh... I work another project with one of the biggest rappers ever, li literally, I Icon, and nobody bought it at first. Somebody eventually did, but it just goes to show you just never know. But mm -hmm. it, it is very tough to bring. It's gotten easier, though, I think, in the last five years because black culture as a whole, Black Panther, um, Gay Little Nas X, Nicki Minaj, um, TV shows, Issa Rae, black culture in general has permeated mainstream culture and hip-hop you know, when we was doing it, we was the outlaws of it. The ghetto boys are outlaws. You guys are pioneers. You had to break that door for Tip. You had to break that for Little Baby, for Future. You guys did that. And so I see that all of the work that I did, you know, by Suge or Easy e or whoever in the 90s, now opens the door to make things easier. There's kids like Issa Rae who can come in after me. There's a Kenya Barris who can come in after me after all of the work we did to open the door. So it is easier, but it's tough as hell. Because yeah. you still have nine people of color, nine times out of ten, buying stories about people of color um, and nobody in charge of that company. It's like a record business. I'm sure when you get a deal, you walk in the label, ain't nobody, maybe the A&R is black, but I'm sure all the executives probably are white and Jewish, I would imagine. Do it appear that they're more interested in our blues than our rhythm? Mm, both, I think. I, yeah. I mean, but you just said it at, at our panel at NRG. Is that black death is is capital is 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 money? Um, Biggie Smalls is worth more money dead probably, mm -hmm. and his story of pain and poverty and Tupac's whatever is more sellable. I don't think you know me graduating from Columbia and then going to work as a journalist is is entertaining as a black kid talking about his drugs and problems and whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you'd rather buy that. You'd rather buy the Juice World, XX and Tyler Shion's story of black pain mm -hmm. and bipolar death and mm -hmm. stress than you know the Will Smith story. You know what I mean? You mentioned Will Smith. Mm -hmm. You being a showrunner for some of the biggest shows on television, you being a director, a producer. Let's say you was producing the Oscars on, <laughs> on that infamous slap night. Will Parker was there, actually, by the way. Will Parker's a black I mean, showrunner. Yeah, a black Will, man was producing Will that Parker night. Will Parker produced yeah. it. Yeah, yeah I know. There. I know. Black, and I, there was a black man producing that show. But since Will is not here, I got to ask you. you you're you here. <laughs> and I'm saying, if you, were he, if you were there, if you were in Will's spot, wow. that was your spot, this is your show, you're producing, and Will come out, I mean, just... Throw a monkey wrench in the whole show by going up on the stage and slapping Chris Rock. Yes. What Do you continue to just act like nothing happened and give Will Smith an award later? I mean, do y'all continue to film all of that stuff and that's allow a, him a, to sit in the audience? I, and I, Will is my homie. I, 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 I love Will Smith. That's the dude. You know, that's, my, that's my yeah, guy. Exactly we, have, right. we, we toured yeah, together. Yeah, right. But, I mean... I'm just asking from a professional standpoint, what do you? What would you do as a director, a producer of the show? Well, um, that's a tough one. Uh, I remember one time I was doing the Vibe Awards, and uh, I think the people have talked about it, but Fifty slapped one of the Fifty Cent slapped one of the members of Onyx. If you can go in, if you people know anything about history, and this was in the hallway, I think, and we didn't know what to do, right? And we're like, well, damn. The show. Hold on, who did he slap? <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that. Whoever got slapped by Fifty at the uh, in Onyx, you know who you are. Um, and then later, I produced the Source Hip Hop Music Awards, the TV show. And so, one of the Source Awards got interrupted by a fight. Right, multiple, two of them got interrupted by a fight. I was on stage at that particular time. 
It was Death Row versus Snoop, because Snoop and Death Row was going back and forth. Suge sent a bunch of goons. They all had on red T-shirts. And the goons from Snoop from was on one side, and then Dog and all his homies, and they literally ran to the middle of the stage and started fighting on stage. This really happened in real life. We had to stop the show. I'm giving you context to the, the Will situation. We had to stop that show. We went the next day and continued to film, I think it was the next couple of days, because the uh, police, the Pasadena police stopped the show. There's like, it got to stop because of the fighting. They just was afraid that all was going to help break loose. So in that case, the police stopped it. But if I was there that night with Will, I'm not sure that Hollywood would know what to do when a star that powerful and that well-known who's not known for that. I think everybody, I probably wish just would have been shocked. Like, did Will Smith just slap Chris Rock? But I'm on live television too, by the way. You understand that I'm not taping something and I, that source of words, I could stop down. That vibe of words, I could stop it, come back in 45 minutes and reassess. So I did what Will did. I probably would have kept the show going. Um, it's fucked because Will got robbed of that moment because he lost his temper. And so do you, uh, I'm guessing, you know he's going to win the Oscar. Everybody knew that he was going to win the Oscar for that. Do you stop this moment, this biggest moment in his whole career because he's just made him a stake? Should he, like the Snoop situation, be the subject of some of those guys got arrested because he just hit someone. That's a felony. You just slap somebody on live television, you got to get arrested. I've become a witness now. If I'm Will Packer, I'm a witness to that, right? I've been in situations where I've been somewhere and I was at an event and I saw, this was that death row event with uh, with Quick and this is like whatever. And so Quick and the people were, the guys were antagonizing Quick from the stage. He was a blood in their crypts. They got into a dispute. He jumped off the stage, started fighting him. The guy ended up dying. I saw him get stumped to death in real time. So if I'm Will Packer watching Will Smith, I've now become a witness to a crime. And I think Will Smith got off. He was supposed to go go to jail. If I'm right now, if I get up and just punch Willie D in the face, you call the police, I got to get arrested. Right? I ain't calling the police. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we know you ain't, you ain't calling no police, and we know you got hands. So I don't think you're going to be doing no snitching. But I'm saying, yes, I think I would have kept the show going. But yeah. I, I uh, Will Smith had to pay for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that was... You know, Chris Rock is an amazing talent, man. But you know, uh, anyway, let's let's, <laughs> let's 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 move on from, from there. No, have you ever had any of those guys that you covered, especially like in hip hop, where you had to write an article? Maybe that article was uh, uh, an article where you was bringing them to task. You were calling mm. them to task. Approach you. And say, yo, man, yo, Frank, what's up with that article, bro? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always used to talk about, because what happened was for me to get started in hip-hop journalism was that I was a reporter at the L.A. Times and just so happened during the time of Death Row coming up. And so I started out writing bios for Death Row. I just happened to know Daz and Corrupt. And then I went from that. I met Dave Mays at Columbia, and he, like, put me in touch with the editor. So I was a black man at a white mainstream publication writing about hip hop and then later at the source doing it. And so I remember uh, a member of the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, the biggest, tallest member of the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, somebody had written something about the Wu-Tang. I didn't do it, but I was with him about to interview him and another member. And he's like, fuck those journalists. Those journalists, they always act like little bitches and whatever else and whatever. And I think they had slapped one person that I know, the members of the Wu-Tang clan and um i was like well you know that's not me and i'm like you know i don't take you know I try, I'm, I'm here just to do my job and tell a story but ain't nobody gonna run up on me homeboy and so i think now, it's who different got, who got slapped uh, a friend of mine another journalist had slapped got slapped the by the got slapped by one of the members of the wu-tang right and so a few months later maybe not too long later i was with the wu-tang and then they were like those journalists because they didn't really like journalists i mean back then mm -hmm. they didn't you know a lot of artists did not like journalists even though we was there to write about it if you're from the street you don't really like want to be like telling your story or being interviewed. We had a different time where everybody's giving all their business down and running their mouth on the internet, but there was a time when the artist, there was a there was a uh, distance between the artist and the public, and the journalist was the person that brought you their story. You didn't have Instagram and Twitter where somebody could DM Rihanna. So, yes, there's been times, and, you know, we ended up, nothing happened, but um, I was with Suge multiple times, and uh, when Suge uh, got... The probation violation, when him and Pac got shot, he got out of jail. 
2001, or he was still in jail at Mule Creek Prison. And so I went to go visit him there in the day room. And so uh, he he could spill very negative energy. He was talking about Eddie Murphy was a, you know, and then he'd talk about Prince and they all almost, you know, whatever he was saying. And, you know, they're all rats and puffs. You know, he was going crazy on a lot of people. You know, he even mentioned Farrakhan once. And so um, I like, wrote that. Like in a disparaging man? Farrakhan? Uh, and I think that he was just, he was the kind of guy to just to be controversial just on purpose. And I think he thought by being hard or whatever, but I was like, you got so much negative energy, Suge, and you say all these things about these people. And he's like, well, you know, they all gay in Hollywood and they all fucking, you know, and there was a, there was a picture in death row, by the way, on the one used to be on a Santa Monica or San Vicente office. And it was like Buffy and it was a picture of big and puff, like having sex and those animals or something like that. And so... I wrote this about him, but I took him to task when I was asking him the questions. In the article, I took him to task. I ended up getting some beef at the source with people because they didn't want that out. But I'm like, you don't have the pulpit to say that. Kind of, I, I don't feed into that. And then later, you know, I saw Sugar out multiple times. We finally made some peace, but he did confront me. Yeah, you know, and I was like, well, you said that. And I wasn't, I'm like, he's like, well, why you have to, you know, put that that way? And, you know, I was like, well, you said it. And everybody else is afraid to say something to you. And you told me that. He told me once, he's like, I fuck with you because you're not afraid. But then when I told that truth, he wasn't that happy about it. You know what I mean? Well, clearly, uh, Suge Knight w at one point was a very, very intimidating person. Uh, and his reputation preceded him. I mean, like, if you have to honestly say, like, there had to be some level of fear there. Of course, of course. Like, on a scale of 1 to 10, what that fear level was. That fear was big, but the only reason I'm saying I knew him already, you understand what I'm saying? Me and him had multiple conversations, and I would I would talk to him in a way, not like, I'm, oh, I could beat Shug up. You know, it's not like he's yeah. big, but I ain't no little guy either. But he, see, the thing is, people think, people like him want to go and be confronted and talk about shit. They, when everybody's just afraid of you, that's not the kind of niggas that he really want to fuck with. He would rather talk to somebody who was like, well, what you feel? What's up? What's your real, you know, going, whatever. So going I think back was, to the white I, folks I and think, the coconuts. I think that there was a level of respect with us where I wasn't trying to denigrate him. But I told him, I am the people. All these people want to ask you questions. I want to know about you. They're never going to get a chance to see the blood red carpet and the piranhas and whatever. So I go and describe that to them. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so it's my job to ask you tough questions. Did you, were you involved in the murder of Tupac? Did you have him killed? Was Tupac gonna get? You know, just shit that motherfucker wanted to know. You asked Shug that? Yes, of course. Yes. And what did he tell you? He's like, I never do that. That's my little brother. I loved him. And I don't think he was a part of it at, by no means. No, neither do I. Yeah, I don't think so. No. Who do you think killed Pac? Uh, I know everybody. There's so many conspiracies. Uh, well, first of all, hip hop killed Tupac. Uh, hip hop killed Chris Big. Um, Orlando, I think, shot him, my guess. Um, whoever was in the backseat. But um, he bragged about it, by the way. In real life, um, and I think you know who bragged about it in real life? Orlando Anderson. Oh, Orlando. Yeah. And by the way, people yeah. again, I'm not. You know, there was a conspiracy to government or whatever, Shug or whatever. Out of Shug's own mouth, he told me when I did who shot Biggie and Tupac. When he looked across in the car, he knew the people in the car. I want to make sure people understand that it's not the mafia, it's not the fucking government or a conspiracy. It was Crips and Bloods who had a prior relationship for many years. There was a string of incidents that led up to that. That wasn't just that one moment. When Tupac ran to go hit Orlando, he knew the guy, one of the guys who was with Tupac said, hey, that's the nigga that would stock our chain, whatever. And Tupac, at that particular time, and I'm not, obviously I'm friends with Pac's friends and his family, whatever. Tupac was out of pocket for that. And he, he knows that, you know, it cost him his life, unfortunately. And I'm not saying nothing that nobody hasn't said. And he put himself in a gang situation that he had no business getting into because he's the prize. You're the you're Tupac. You're the reason why everybody's here. You're making money. You're supposed to protect him. And Shook should have never let him do that. But Tupac did that on his own, by the way. I want to make sure people realize that Tupac ran up. You could see the video where Tupac runs up on him and hits him. And it's all related to a gang situation. Then they get in the car that night and they find him. And the ironic, I've done all these shows, some girls would say, Tupac, Tupac. And that's why the guys hurt him. They went first to the club to see if they were there. Mm -hmm. This was a gang situation. 702. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, um, I think Orlando shot Tupac, and he obviously lost his life after that. Yeah, it was well 
known that Orlando did it because my little cousin was 11 years old and he lived at the time he was living in Compton. Mm -hmm. He was like, one of my buddies was like, man, who killed Tupac? He's like, man, Orlando Anderson killed ba baby, ba what do you call baby him? Baby Lane. Baby Lane. Baby, baby Lane. Lane. Baby Lane killed him. He, he lived right down the street. Correct. He said, wait a minute, he lived down the street and ain't nobody messing with him? Ain't nobody gonna mess with him? You know, everybody know Pac was a capper. You know, do 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 this eleven year old talking like mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, you're right. It was a string of, right, of incidents that happened before that, well before that ever mm -hmm. even happened, and there was a lot of like bad blood already. Yeah, and he just got and, himself involved in something that he had no business getting himself involved and, in. And, he, and here's the thing: what people have to understand, because I know a lot of people they like, man, you know, man, you damned if you do, you damned if you don't. In terms of making it, making something out of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Tupac was revered worldwide, especially for a guy that came from nothing, rose to fame. When people see guys like him, you, me, do that, it gives them hope. Mm -hmm. So most people celebrate that. Most people are pulling for you because they see them a little of themselves in you. Mm -hmm. Pac's problem, like as you, and you know, as Tupac you alluded to, I mean, yeah. you, yes, of course you did. As you alluded to, Pac crossed the civilian line. Mm. If he had not crossed that civilian line, he would have been that baby lane. Would have, man, let me get a picture, let me get an autograph. Correct. You Correct. know, but Pac crossed. Even the, even though he was hanging out with these blood dudes, if Pac would have never been, you know, like behaving you know, like a g actual gang member and right. put and actually putting in work, mm -hmm. then I absolutely think that I would have no doubt that Pac would still be here Correct. today. Correct, correct, yeah. Because sad, it's a sad story, I mean, no matter all the way around. And I think, uh, too, to heart. me, one of the stories that, you know, uh, and obviously I love Tupac, we come from the same background, you know, mother and drugs and, you know, Black Panthers and Oakland Liberty almost got the same birthday, and he's a guy that I think when you're young, you're trying to figure out your life, and I think that lack of a father played a big role in his life, and he was... Um, you know, you can ask his family. One of the stories I heard one time was that uh, Shook took him to a basketball game. Uh, I think it was the Chicago Bulls. And they were sitting on the sideline. And uh, Tupac says to him, this is what I always wanted, is my dad to take me to a basketball or take me to a game. Mm -hmm. So that's looking for a father figure and you clasp on the Suge, and you put yourself in that situation, potentially, I can't speak for Pac, but um, I'm guessing that you were trying to prove how down you were, and that you, here's my f kind of big brother father figure, look, I'm really down with y'all, look, I'm gonna put in work too. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's a part of it, I think, it's not just, um, let me be a, hit somebody, but it was something deeper than that, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and covering all of these stories, uh, about these uh, unfortunate deaths of uh, of uh, hip hop icons, have you ever had the FBI come at you and ask you for information? Like ask you or ask you, did you know know of any information or know this person or show you some pictures or something like that? Because they do that often. <laughs> like if somebody start talking about a uh, you know a, a murder or whatever, or an investigation, and here they come. They, they want to ask questions. Um. Yeah, you know, one day I was walking out of my office at the source. The source used to be in Union Square in New York City. Uh, I would say this is 2000, 2001. And I think it was Ray Benzino on the source where me investigated by the FBI. They came, FBI, they came and raided the office. And they took a bunch of records and computers and stuff like that. Um, and they were investigating incidents of violence and threatening with guns and situations with the source. They were just all in the business. They called me up. They was like, hey, uh, some picked the phone. I was like, this is Frank Williams. I was like, yeah, this is the FBI or whatever they said. Uh, we wanted, you know, we're investigating such and such. And we'd like for you to come down to Boston and talk about whatever, whatever. And uh, what had happened was there was situations where people had pulled guns on people or threatened to do things to people. And I happened to be there. And other people knew that I had saw that, even though I had never came to them and say, I know, whatever. And so, yes, they did. Um, I was forced to testify. Um, so you had to, so you had to go to Boston. Uh, Did they pay for your trip? Yes. 
Was it first class? Uh, I don't remember that. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> but obviously, you know, they paid for my trip and they did. You know, I, I, I was like, no, I don't whatever. But they was like, well, no, you can't. You can't tell them no. There's no no. You know. But when I got there, they started asking me, were you here when Ray Benzino threatened such and such, or did you know that he said such and such was gonna get thrown off a roof, or I'm gonna kill you, or you know, a gun was brandished, or were you such and such? I was like, damn, I don't remember that. When was that? Abba, dabba, dabba. Oh, Abba, damn. Dabba, dabba. <laughs> when, what, they say I was there? Oh, I can't, man. We were partying so much. I, I can't recall that, sir. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hit that I can't recall. Because <laughs> that way, no matter what, they can't say you lied. Right, right. And so hey, I don't recall. That was their word against mine that I was yeah. in the office. And I had actually been there, and I had actually seen some of the things that they said. They, were, they weren't lying. Yeah. But I'm not. Even to Dave, I told Dave, you know, Dave Mays, shout out to Dave. Even though he did some shit and he did some shit to me or whatever, I'm still going to stick to the code and still not, you know, because it's still them against us. Now, you know, I'm still the Black Panther in my head, you know, mm-hmm. Huey's uh, grandson. But, yeah, I did have to go testify for the FBI. And one time I was doing American Gangster, I did an episode about this guy, Felix Mitchell, who's a very famous drug dealer. A lot of people say New Jack City is based on Felix a little bit. He, he was up on the East Coast, right? No, in Oakland. Was that Oakland? Yeah, and he, had, he was one of the first Felix guys to pioneer Mitchell. the lookouts. On top of the roof, it's like okay. 85. He was one of the first. If you look at New Jack City, there's lookouts and they tell, hey, what you doing? Like the 12, 13 year old kids. And so um, I went to the FBI because they had been surveilling. I just had had another friend and I looked through some old articles and I found a couple of FBI names and I happened to call them and say, hey, whatever. And one of the guys happened to still be there. And I went there. They pulled out the box of evidence for Felix and they had pictures of him surveilling him. They had pictures of people he had killed with the bullet in their head slumped over the thing. They had pictures of the kids, lookouts, the whole thing. They had all of the FBI records. So there's been times when they, they've called me and forced me. And there's time when they've helped me. So, um, yes, I did, unfortunately, um, have to deal with that. And I know that I've been surveilled. I know that I'm writing about controversial shit and, you know, uh, conspiracies against the, you know, Panthers and COINTELPRO. And I'm not writing about, like, what's Will Smith's protein shake. I'm writing about real shit. And so, just like Tupac, I'm sure they have a record of who I am and, you know, or knowing what I was doing. Yeah. We had a conversation yesterday, and we were talking about the greatest pop icon ever. Like, who's, uh, the, <laughs> who's the greatest? Here we go with this shit. Who's the greatest? <laughs> who's the greatest? But I think we agreed on yeah, everybody. Oh Michael Jack is the greatest entertainer. Yeah, entertainer, right? But is he a better performer? Or artist? artist? Is he Prince a is a artist? better artist. Yeah. Right? There's a Prince difference. Prince is a better artist. Right. But, R. Kelly is a better artist. But Stevie is even better. Than them all, probably. Yeah, because Stevie did what they did with his eyes closed. Yeah, he didn't, couldn't see nothing. He couldn't see. Right. People always he say. He did it blind. Right, and you one of the great rappers. So let me say this to you. How many people in the whole entertainment that you know and music that we come from, you could lock into a room, Roger, by the way, could do the same thing, Roger Trotman, with uh, recording, you know, instruments and a bunch of instruments and some tape and go make a whole album by themselves. And it'd be jamming. It'd be jamming. Not many. Not many. Stevie Wonder can. Yeah. Prince can. Yes. And, and to his credit and everybody I know is whatever said about Robert, but he could do the same. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, very, very, very Baby talented. Babyface could do it. Babyface could do it. Yeah, there's like about yeah, 10 he, people, 20 people that could do that. Yeah, he could yeah, do it. Yeah. Babyface, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you know Babyface, I don't know why when people start talking about these great writers, they don't mention Babyface as often as they should because Babyface lays some hits down, Correct. Man. And for multiple generations, too. Yeah. yeah and for other people. <laughs> yeah, that's when you really get your money, right? When you say, yeah. fuck writing for me, I'm going to write for somebody else. Yeah. yeah, man, Babyface is that dude. What has been the most rewarding part of your journey? Wow, that's a really good question. I've never been asked that question. Um, I think that looking back, you know, I always say when somebody looks back 100 years from now and say, damn, Willie D, who was Willie D? What did he do? Oh, he was in the Ghetto Boys. Oh, they, they spoke out against the government. They talked about mental health. They pioneered Southern rap, right? Whatever they going to put for your name, right? When you look back, then nobody, all your relatives are dead. I think that I uh, was a part of the culture making it. Just like, you know, 
all you guys pioneered hip hop for us to get to this place where now all these big little babies and little babies and dub babies and medium baby or whatever <laughs> are at the top of the charts, right? Um, hip hop is the number one culture in the world. They will say, yeah. hey, this dude wrote this in 1995 about Eric Wright. His dude put this TV show. This dude, you know, did whatever with 50. So I think that contributing to the culture is going to be my legacy that I, I was the people that told the story of the culture and brought it to you without mm -hmm. me doing all of that stuff in the 90s with, you know, Suge and Biggie and whatever else, it doesn't get to this place because all those kids who read those magazines or watch those shows now are accepting it more and buying these tickets and going to 50 and bust the show. So that's what I think is the legacy is that I told the story of hip hop and I did it with integrity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely did do it with integrity, bro. And you're still doing it with integrity. You know, something else that you do with integrity. <laughs> Dress. <laughs> you, you, you got a little style, man. I've been watching you lately. Yeah, yeah. I try to stay fly. You got a little style, you know man. Yes. I, well, you know, I, you I, know, I, up I, I don't know when people want to say this part because I know people, uh, sometimes black people don't want to. I did Freak Nick, and so they, there was a whole part of Freak Nick, by the way, where middle class, and you talk about this because I know you, middle class people, is, why are these black people out here shaming us with all this dancing and acting crazy in the street and whatever? So they didn't want to embrace that part of the black tradition which Freak Nick came from. But I grew up around players and pimps and hustlers and so in real life. And so in my neighborhood, the Max, you know, they had fur coats on and they, they, was, you know, they had curls and waves. And so a part of me, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately took that. And I always believe you have to dress how you feel. And I have to tell you this. People react differently to me by the way that I'm dressed. If I have Absolutely. a suit on, if I have yeah. do whatever, and if I give off the energy, people believe that. It, you dress, and people, how you present yourself is how people are going to take you. One time I was, um, uh, this was the year Holly Berry and Denzel won the Oscar, um, whatever year that was, and she was Monsters Ball, and then he won for... Uh, say that shit again, or whatever that shit is, uh, when he's a detective. Whatever year that was, they both won. So me and my uh, training girl... Training day? Uh, training day. Whatever the year that they both won an Oscar that same night, she won for Monsters Ball. Well, he's the only won two, so yeah, but that, that would have been training day. Training day. Yeah. And so I was out door in, in Hollywood, uh, me and my then uh, wife. And so we were going to this other event, right? And that's what we thought where we were going. And then I just happened to see Marlon Wayans or somebody. I'm like, what up? He's like, oh, you coming in? And I was like, sure, yeah, I'm coming in. It's all good. Yeah, he's like, well, let's go. Let's go. And I was like, okay. And I get into the room. It's Holly Berry's and Denzel Washington's Oscar party. But because I looked the part and I mm -hmm. was, they thought I was somebody, there's, you know, Amon and Naomi Campbell and fucking, you know, Prince and all these people, everybody famous except me. But I looked like I was famous or I looked like I was somebody. So when you dress that way or feel that way, just like yesterday when we were walking around in the center, I was telling my girls, like, we look like aliens to them, right? They're all working. They're kind of like workers. And we all flash. You got the chains. You got big old blue suits. You looking like you just came out of the Don King management team and shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I think it's important because that's, you know, it, it, it plays a part. When I walk in a line in the um, airport, I can feel the energy from people sometimes because mm -hmm. of the way that you present yourself. So, but in, in theory, yes, I did get it from the players and hustlers. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it works for me too, man. And I know with the ladies, man, ladies love suits, man. <laughs> they love a man in a suit, man. They love that. Like, what I mean, happened to the tradition yeah. of us dressing up and going out? Do you, I mean, I mean, I saw the Beyonce mm. thing, but it just feels like nobody just wants to present anything. Like, remember when your mom or your daddy, when you're young, they're like, they got to put on their clothes, or you you pick your clothes for the week, and you're like, damn, I'm going to the concert on Saturday, I'm going to the club, and Everybody got on some Yeezys and some fucking T-shirts. Maybe it's all part of that just that lazy brain syndrome uh. that we all have today, that many of us have today. Like, people don't even put on... You talk about dressing up. Hell, people don't even get out of their uh, night clothes and go, when they go to the mall right. these days. You know, they walk around in house shoes, you know, at, to, at, the, at the gas the station. I remember I was, telling, I was like, I used to dress up to go to the airport. Yeah, I would have like a little shirt or just you know I wouldn't I would I'm, gonna, I'm like I'm going to go fly like it was a big deal now everybody got on bonnets and pajamas and shit walking to the airport I'm like what the hell is going on you know yeah 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 sometimes I have to as much as I know that the ladies love a man in, in a nice suit and it and it they really look mm -hmm. when you got a nice suit on 
I just, you know, I have to talk myself into it a lot of times because I just want to be lazy and just throw on anything and just get out. But you do get you a know? different reaction from Willie D in a suit oh, yeah. and Willie D with a little, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. right. Yeah, man. Um, so in, in your mind, who has uh, inspired you most in film and television? Who's that guy? that you look to and you say, if I can just do half of what he's done, mm. my legacy going to be secured. Hmm. That's a good one. Um, I think it's a combo of a few people. Uh, I look up to Reggie Hutland. Reggie Hutland directed House Party, Boomerang. Um, Oscars. We worked together in a WACP. But he pioneered, you know, black cinema with Spike and all of that in the 90s, and now has been able to keep his foot in mainstream Hollywood but still do stuff for black people. Um, I worked early on with a woman named Suzanne DePass. Suzanne DePass yeah. uh, discovered Michael Jackson and Jackson 5 and groomed yeah, them and yeah. was Barry Gordy's person and did the Motown 25 and all of that. I worked on um, Showtime at the Apollo with her. And so she's somebody I look up to. And then for me, my goal is to continue to tell these black stories, but I also work in white mainstream Hollywood. So I'm not I'm not relegated to working on a black network or something mm -hmm. like that. I work for Hulu or WeTV. So um, my goal is to be the black Jerry Bruckheimer. He goes and make a show. He makes a blockbuster movie. He goes back. That's my goal. You know, my goal is to be more like the hip hop Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm. Tyler's taking his own independent thing and told these stories. And if you like whatever he's talking about or not, you can't be mad at the business part of it. So that's my goal is to continue to um, infiltrate why Hollywood and bring as many people as I can and still keep my brothers and sisters the main stories that I tell, you know, uh, that's the goal. And in terms of life inspiration, um, Muhammad Ali and Huey Newton um, are two people that I kind of base my vibe on or whatever because Muhammad was outspoken and didn't care the consequences that he was going to have to deal with because he knew there was a greater good down the line. Huey, though, um, troubled and obviously had issues um, was more concerned about his people and he put his people on his back to his detriment and obviously to his death. But uh, I come from that tradition, so I can't even, I don't even know how to think without thinking like that. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so those are the people that I look for in terms of entertainment, but also in terms of just people that I look up as goals, um, human beings. What is your, the people back where you grew up at, what are they saying about you? What do they, um, what do they think of you? Like, any, give, give me a... Well, I, I get hate and love. Yeah, okay. Give me a give me a, an example of of the of the of the hate and the love. Um, maybe that was a particular incident that happened. Uh, well, I mean, I say this: it always is people closest to you. You know, that's the one they always say: this people you got to watch. I had a cousin who I kind of knew, but didn't grow up that much. Um, and. Uh, a lot of times, people are very proud of me coming from the environment that I came from, and they see me with celebrities or whatever, or they write when we read in my article. My, people are like, you know, bragging to their friends, like, that's my cousin. They in the jail cell, they, my cousin wrote this, or that's my cousin TV show, or whatever. So it's, it's mm -hmm. usually love. But uh, there was a cousin who I had was like, fuck him, he think he all of that. Mm -hmm. He ain't nothing, he just, he ain't shit anyway. He fake. So, the, so basically, the nothing ain't shit cousin said you was nothing and ain't shit. Correct. We later <laughs> reconciled and made peace, and he was like, he was like, he was mad, and I'm like, but how are you gonna be mad at me for me not being stuck in an environment? You know, I'm both the black sheet and the hero. You know, and I, and I embrace both. I'm fine with that. Um, and obviously, <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay. I understand that's life, right? And then, but majority of the time, they're proud. So like, oh, that's my man, or damn, they see you, whatever, or like, damn, I see a show you did, or that's my cousin, or that's my friend, or that's my boy. So at least from Oakland, I get a lot of love, you know, because I put the city in terms of media on my back uh, and have for like, you know, 25, 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about uh, some of these cities uh, naming streets after uh, some of the, you know, some of our contemporaries? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think that's amazing. I saw they did a Triquat Quest in Queens and Oakland to get a too short uh, street. Uh, I think it just shows uh, the level that hip hop has permeated the culture and that, you know, those kind of things that like for government officials or 
Mandela or people like that. But we are also freedom fighters and truth tellers in the same way. And so even though Todd mm. Too Short may say, you know, what's my favorite word, bitch, he pioneered independent music. And a lot of the scratch that a lot of those artists that him and 40 did were able to do that because of them. So I think taking the good, you know, Amiri Baraka talks about sometimes we don't realize the good meat of things. So there's a lot of good meat in hip hop. There's a lot of bad meat. But I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, hip hop has gotten to the place. You know, I saw the other day where uh, Kamala Harris had a hip hop 50th thing at the White, White House or Vice President's house. Or yeah, she was in there boogalooing, chugging and jiving. But, but go ahead. I, you could say whatever about her and the politics, but yeah. the fact that all of us was at the motherfucking vice president's house, young Jeezy's on stage, who's the snowman, the fucking crack king, is on stage at the... That just shows you how far they would have even let us go there in 94. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it does show how far we've come because... They need us. They've right. always needed us. Right. But they've need, you know, like Barack wouldn't have gotten in without hip hop. Correct. You know, that was, that was hip hop. Mm. That was all of those bricks that the house of hip hop built mm. that, you know, eventually opened the door that actually built the door and then opened that gave gave Barack the key to, you know, get through that door. Right. That's what got Barack Obama elected. Mm. It was hip hop. All these young people who ain't never voted in their life, you know, people that was turning 18 for the first time couldn't wait, you know, to punch that ticket. Right. That's how he got in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you mentioned <coughs> you mentioned Kamala Harris and, and, <clears throat> and you mentioned like, yeah, we 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 got there. We we're there now. We're in the White House. We're at the vice president's house and partying and stuff like that. But. You know, I say but, you know, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, those are symbolic gestures, you know, like, we need, don't you think we need something more substantive? Of course, I'm not saying it, but substantive? I think that it's important now that Killer Mike can go advise the mayor of Atlanta, that uh, Fabby Davis in Oakland can go talk to the mayor and say, hey, we have these problems and these issues, you know. Um, I do think I was talking to someone yesterday and talking about hip hop in its essence is the voice of the voiceless. It was people who were the outcast. Hip hop, by the way, started as a friend of punk music. Punk music, we were the outlaws. They embraced each other. I don't know if people know this, but in the beginning, hip hop and punk dudes used to party in the same clubs because they wouldn't let us in other clubs. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this to say, I think that we've lost a lot of the political nature of us. You guys talk about the government, the FBI, Jay Prince being followed, whatever, they're antagonizing him. I don't think that we have that. I think a lot of the stuff we have now is symbolic, like you said. I was happy at the party, but you are correct. I think that we don't, we can't go change legislation. We can't change laws as much as we should, and that's the real power. The fact that LL Cool J can host the Grammys is amazing for me because I remember they wouldn't even fucking let us in the room. But... If he can be on the board of NARIS and then make change, and I see the Oscars now, they're inviting more black people of color to be members. So I do think that's power. You know, power is me being on the board of something and being able to bring more people of color in, and that's power. Me being uh, common and going to the White House and say, hey, Southside Chicago need funding for such and such. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of symbolism, but I do think there is some movements that we've made politically and socially and economically, but I don't think we're that concerned. I think we're more concerned with driving a Bentley and wearing some Louis and then popping a bottle. You know what I mean? I, the whole VIP pop a bottle shit is just so ridiculous to me uh, from where we started. But i hopeful that, you know, uh, I do think things are changing. I think that there is a politicalness amongst the millennials and Gen Z that's sometimes good. You know what I mean? There people talk about how they're so self-obsessed with themselves, but... I do think that they are concerned that they the Black Lives Matter thing to me really reminded me of Black Panthers today. You know, obviously the Black Panthers, we had shotguns. They had a camera. But um, I think we need more of us worried about changing law than can I get on Kamala Harris's VIP list. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and using that money to <clears throat> create resources for our people and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Like instead of just being consumers, we like you. You can't consume your way to freedom. Mm. 
You have to produce mm. freedom, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what we got to get used to. And I know for a lot of us, we 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 fought so hard to get to where we are. We just want want to just enjoy the fruits of our labor. Mm -hmm. But we can only go high. One of us can go only go as high as the group does. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know for some people they don't care about that. They say, "Man, as long as I'm getting mine, I'm straight. I'm straight. Right. F everybody else. Right. It's money over everything." Mm -hmm. But for me, I'd rather, you know, if I can get an opportunity to create jobs, if I can get an opportunity to to bust into a, a new industry, and be able to um, provide. A, a help provide a lifestyle for people mm -hmm. that they may not otherwise have. I want to do that, and I want to try to be in a position where I can affect as many lives as possible. That way we're not always going to people and asking people and begging people to give us an opportunity who were indoctrinated not to give us an opportunity. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. like, we're going to these places we're going to college and we're getting out and we're hoping and praying these people give us an opportunity and we have to doctor our resumes and hope that they don't ask for a picture and, you know, we can't really use our real name, you know, because, you know, it sounds too black. And Well, I, I tell you, I know when I was younger, I was like, I would make sure my name wasn't ethnic. Because I didn't want to be like, because I was going to judge right before you're right. Yeah, and and un unfortunately, we live in this type of society where if you give your kid an ethnic sound, black ethnic sounding name, then you're gonna you're gonna put them at a social disadvantage, mm -hmm. and that's just what it is. Right. Yeah. P. Frank Williams. Thank you for coming on the show, man. Well, he did. Look, look before before we go, I I, I did want to ask you this: When it's time for you to go and you ain't got no more, how do you want to be remembered? Mm. It's a good one. You know, uh, I still operate, and I know it sounds like stereotypical and it may sound cliche, but I still operate by the G code. You know, you guys know about the G code and both a gentleman and a gangster. And so I think that epitomizes who I am in terms of um, being from a, a certain environment but operating like a classy, grown man. And so that's my goal is that, um, you know, when I'm there, I'm hoping that people say, well, damn, that was my boy. He, he, um, he was a good guy and he operated with integrity and he operated and he wasn't afraid to try to challenge the system and change things. I hope that I've made some change in my life and uh, provided opportunity. I think that my goal is always to f create more P. Franks. There needs to be 50 more, 100 more of them who come from those environments. And people, you know, when I was young, uh, they were trying to abort me because my mother was a teenage mother. And I think I carry that on my shoulder, like um, coming from those environments and going to Ivy Leagues and all this kind of stuff. We have to prove why we're there. And so for me, I want to, on my epitaph, it was like he went for it. And he did it with integrity. And uh, he was pretty fly when he was doing it, too. So that's my guy. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, we see you. We hear you. We love you. We respect you. Appreciate it. You're an inspiration. Thank you, my brother. Make sure you watch Freaknik, the Wildest Story Never Told, coming on Hulu. I got another show that's going to be coming out on the next year on TV One. It's a music competition. So I'm still out here in the mix, you know, doing this thing. And I'm finalizing a project with Ben Crump on Henrietta Lacks, which is the first black woman who sells their mortar cells. That's an audio podcast with Audible. So, so the things I'm, I'm working on, and you hit me up at, at P. Frank Williams. I don't have no baby, middle baby. It's just my name, my government, P. Frank. <laughs> no more talk. <laughs> Appreciate you, bro. <laughs>